All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. Uh, my name is Lou Beck, and I work for the Department of Veterans Affairs. I have the privilege this afternoon of moderating the session on current approaches to hearing health care delivery. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, our first presentation is the spectrum of hearing impairment. Um, our speaker is Therese, Therese Hanath Chisholm, who is an audiologist and the Department Chair of Communication Disorders at the University of South Florida. Our second uh, presenter is Margaret Walhagen, who is a nurse and a professor of gerontologic nursing at the University of California, San Francisco. Our third speaker is Nikolai Biscard, who is the Vice President of Industry Relations at GN Resound. And I guess Terry will be our first speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Lou. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the conference organizers for inviting me here today. It is a little chillier than in Florida, but it's always fun to come to DC. Um, I was given the title to talk and asked to talk about the spectrum of hearing impairment in older adults. And as we heard this morning, age-related hearing loss, which is sometimes also termed presbyacusis, is the slow loss of hearing that people get as they get older. Age-related hearing loss is associated with elevated hearing thresholds, meaning that we cannot hear soft sounds. It also so reduces speech understanding in noisy and echoing environments. And it interferes with the perception of rapid changes in speech, leading to the common complaints that we hear from our older patients in the audiological setting, such as those shown here. Age-related hearing loss not only leads to problems with communication that leads to frustration, but as we heard earlier today, it's been associated with sadness and depression, worry, anxiety, paranoia, and emotional turmoil and insecurity, thus impacting on a person's quality of life. Um, Age-related hearing loss has also been associated in some studies with an increased likelihood of depression and also decrease self-sufficiency in activities of daily living. And as we heard earlier today, um, there is a relationship between hearing loss and incident dementia with Dr. Lin's group being leaders in examining those relationships today. Um, and if, interestingly, if we compare the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease that are commonly given to those of untreated hearing loss, we see that there is a remarkable similarity in complaints. Age-related hearing loss does not have a cure. However, we can utilize many treatments to improve everyday function. And hearing loss can be effect effectively managed so that as we age, we can continue to live a full and active life. Managing for hearing loss, um, healthy hearing for aging, of course, begins with identification. And that topic is not one that I have time to address today, but it's a critical one. And also, it's associated with having individuals believe that hearing is important and that we can treat um, hearing loss effectively. Again, this is a topic that I believe is critically important, but one that I won't have time to address the, today. Um, in talking about a way to manage hearing loss for healthy aging, it is important that we have evidence-based protocols. And the most recent one was developed in 2006 by the American Academy of Audiology, and it is called the Guidelines for the Audiological Management of Adult Hearing Impairment. And of course, 2006 is quite a while ago, so we do have subsequent relevant research that impacts on the development of evidence-based protocols. In an evidence-based protocol approach, we begin by managing hearing loss for healthy aging by completing a comprehensive assessment for, of the hearing impairment, the functional hearing-related difficulties, and the identification of other individual factors which research shows us impacts upon intervention. And once we rule out any medically treatable hearing losses, we then develop an integrated treatment plan that involves both technical aspects and non-technological aspects. And of course, it's important to continually measure the outcomes of our interventions and use the information from our outcomes assessment to modify our treatment plan. 
Let's begin by thinking a minute about comprehensive assessment. Um, we get information about the hearing impairment from the audiological examination leading to a graph such as this, which is called the audiogram. The audiogram tells us how sensitive an individual's hearing is to different sounds that range from low pitch to very high pitch. Um, the degree of hearing loss, as Frank mentioned this morning, can range from mild to profound and is typically described in mild to profound and is typically described in terms of the pure tone average or PTA, which is calculated by averaging sensitivity thresholds for specific frequencies. Unfortunately, age-related hearing loss is just not that simple. We have known for over 60 years that there, there are two components to the type of hearing loss that's exhibited by individuals as a result of aging. There is, of course, the audibility component, but there is also a component that is referred to as distortion. We can deal with the audibility component simply by making sounds louder through hearing aids or other types of listening devices. However, no matter how loud we make the sounds, the distortion component results in problems with the clarity or the cleanness of the signals. Making sounds louder is critically important, but as shown in this visual representation, making a noisy signal bigger does not necessarily increase its clarity. And of course, there are external factors that impact on how well hearing aids and other devices work in the environment. For example, we are constantly listening to speech in a background of noise, which obscures the important speech sounds and distracts the listener. And of course, there's this special type of noise that impacts on speech understanding called, called reverberation. And that's what makes all of you sound so great when you're singing in the shower. However, when you're trying to communicate in many other situations, when, and the reflected sound energy is not in cadence with the original so source, it creates a great deal of difficulty, as shown in this visual analogy here. The additional adding of more visual information does not help with the clarity of this sentence. Can anybody read the sentence? All right, so you guys are all good. You don't suffer from reverberation, Bob. And then, of course, there's the known relationship between the intensity of sounds and distance, such that for every doubling of distance, Shit. the signal loses oh, 6 dB in intensity. These combined effects of noise, no girl, no reverberation, and distance make listening and communicating difficult for all of us. And these difficulties are exacerbated by the effects of hearing loss and aging, and also the age-related processing declines that are associated um, cognitively. So in terms of managing hearing loss for healthy aging, in addition to developing an audiogram, we also need to measure a person's ability to understand speech and noise, as Kathy Pakora Fuller told us early this morning. And clinically, we do have many objective measures of speech understanding and noise that we can use, though I have to admit that's not always done in the clinic. Um, and these yield a signal to noise ratio that a person needs. How much greater does the signal have to be than the noise in order to understand 50% of what is being said? A person with normal hearing typically needs the speech to be two decibels louder than the noise for 50% correct recognition, yielding an SNR 50 of plus 2 dB. While a person with hearing loss might not need the speech to be 12 dB or greater than the noise for 50% correct recognition. Unfortunately, we cannot predict a person's SNR 50 simply by looking at the audiogram as shown in these two from individuals who recently participated in a hearing aid study. So um, one, in addition to getting audiograms and measuring the signal-to-noise ratio for 50% correct recognition, we also need to assess functional hearing-related difficulties. 
Now this can be done, of course, through a detailed case history, but that case history should not necessarily focus on the medical aspects related to the person's hearing loss, but what it's like for that person to live with the hearing loss daily and the social and emotional impact of that hearing loss. And of course, we have many psychometrically valid self-report measures that are, provide useful information for documenting and identifying the, the restrictions and activity limitations and participation restrictions that are associated with hearing loss, such as the measure developed by Barbara Weinstein and used all over the world today. Once, um, and it's also critical in our comprehensive assessment that we examine the individual factors which research has shown us can impinge upon our decisions for intervention and the outcomes for intervention. Once we have the results of our comprehensive assessment, we can develop appropriate treatment goals for a person. These it's critical that your treatment goals be individualized. One size does not fit all for a person with hearing loss. I like to use the client-oriented scale of improvement, which was developed at the National Acoustics Laboratories in Australia, to develop three to five realistic and achievable goals for intervention for my clients. And a nice thing about the COSI procedure, too, is that we can utilize it to measure outcomes at different points after intervention has been initiated and then modify our intervention plan based on the results at that point in time. So what about the interventions? We have both technical interventions and non-technical interventions. In terms of technical interventions, the majority of people with mild to moderate hearing losses can be effectively helped through the use of hearing aids. Based, simply put, what a hearing aid does is take the important acoustical information for speech, which is obscured by the presence of a hearing loss, and increases the level of that speech so now that the person can access the important acoustic speech information. Optimal hearing aid fitting is not a simple process. Numerous evidence-based decisions must be made. And it is critical that once those decisions are made and an individual is fitted with a hearing aid, that we verify the fitting of the hearing aid in terms of both the physical fit and the comfort to the individual and even more important, well, equally important, is the signal processing that's utilized in that hearing aid through a test called real ear measures. The efficacy of hearing interven aid intervention for adults with hearing loss has been established, and the first study on randomized controlled trial was conducted by Mulro in 1990, and we heard Barbara mention this study before. Documented improvements were shown for emotional function, social function, and communication function, as well as measures of cognition and a lessening of depression. And these positive outcomes were sustained for up to one year of hearing aid use. Um, in addition, I'd like to share with you this um, figure from Adrian Davis, which looks at the quality of life assessments as a function of degree of hearing loss. Um, with measured by with the health utilities index with higher numbers indicating increased quality of life. His data showed that um, the, health relate, the health quality of life prior to hearing aid intervention as shown in the blue line significantly decreased with increased hearing loss. And when hearing aids were provided three months post fitting, there were significant increases in this generic quality of life measure. Technical intervention for individuals with more severe to profound hearing impairments cannot adequately be provided by hearing aids. It's just not possible currently to increase the, in the intensity of the speech signal through acoustic amplification to make the important speech sounds accessible to individuals with the most severe hearing losses. However, as we heard all earlier, cochlear implants, which bypass the defective external audio or 
um, cochlea of the, hear, of the ear and directly stimulate the acoustic nerve provide a very efficacious intervention. And you might ask my friend Donna Sorkin about it later today because she is a prime example of a cochlear implant user. There are many decisions that have to be made regarding management with cochlear implants, but there's also much research data that shows significant improvements in terms of understanding speech and the quality of life. But even with the best hearing aids or cochlear implants, combined effects of noise, distance, and reverberation continue to cha present challenges for listening and communicating, particularly for individuals with hearing loss, particularly for individuals who are aging. And when you put the two together, there really are issues. So in terms of our integrated treatment plan, our technical interventions must also include consideration of a category of devices which we refer to as hearing assistive technologies. And Dr. Compton Conley will provide a great deal of information about this to you tomorrow, and she truly is the expert. In one type of uh, hearing assistive technologies, assistive listening devices, the loop in this room is an example of, they can be used alone or combined with hearing aids and cochlear implants to supplement performance in a variety of difficult listening conditions. In general, an assistive listening device works with Dr. Compton Connolly's three principles illustrated here. We have to catch the sounds that are important to the person at the source and through a hard wire or wireless link carry those sounds to the listener and then couple that sound to the person's ear. And of course, we heard earlier about the importance of access to warning sounds and other environmental sounds. And there are categories of hearing assistive technologies that we refer to as alerting devices, which take sounds and present them as visual or tactile signals so that a person can have access to those important sounds. Now, with all of these devices, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of systematic device orientation and instruction regarding use and care. This can be done individually, and I think that's the more common approach, or I know in one of the VAs with which I'm associated, we have, they utilize a group hearing aid orientation approach. Now, you have to have at least one of these, but sometimes I truly think you need several because only about 50% of medical information is typically remembered by individuals, and that's no different for hearing aid orientation or orientation to use any of these other devices. Um, a systematic and a, approach to hear device orientation is one of what I would refer to in the classification of our non-technical interventions. Audiologists tend to refer to this as oral or audiological rehabilitation approaches. And I recently reviewed the um, evidence for the effectiveness of oral rehabilitation approaches for adults along with my colleague Michelle Arnold, and the information can be uh, found in Wong and Hickson's evidence-based practice in audiology. Our review looked at uh, what we are referred to as group approaches to oral rehabilitation, for which a systematic review had been done by Dave Hawkins in 2005, which indicated that these were helpful for addressing the communication needs and psychosocial aspects of hearing loss for individuals. Um, a prime example of a group oral rehabilitation program can be found in the um, evidence-based approach developed by Louise Hickson, Linda Worrell, and Norena Scar Scarinci, and it's called the Active Communication Education Program. In this program, participants first get to know about communication strategies, problem-solving approaches, assistive listening devices, information and advice to give their significant communication partners, and they also practice relaxation techniques. After a week of getting to know about these each week, then they get to try these various approaches out and report back to the clinician about what was successful and what was difficult.
In our review of current approaches to audiological rehabilitation for older adults, we also looked at the class of interventions which I'll refer to as auditory training or listening training. And as Jim pointed out earlier, we might want to combine that listening training with speech reading training because we typically do communicate by looking and listening in most situations. Again, there was good evidence that some of these approaches could improve outcomes for individuals with hearing loss. And since that time, this led to the development of many commercially available computer-based programs, such as the LACE program, which someone mentioned earlier this morning. The LACE training involves looking at uh, modules related to the comprehension of degraded speech, modules that are designed to enhance cognitive skills, and also the provision of helpful hints about communication strategies. Now, even though there is some evidence that these approaches might be helpful, I do need to let you know that in the, the latest systematic review on computer-based auditory training systems for adults with hearing loss, Henshaw and Ferguson found that the efficacy of these programs for training adults with hearing loss was not as robust as we would like to be able to recommend it to all of our patients. So there is need for us to continue our research in terms of optimizing auditory training and auditory training combined with speech reading for adults with hearing loss. So in summarizing the evidence that um, Dr. Arnold and I found, we were concluded that post-fitting group approaches to oral rehabilitation did improve outcomes, both in terms of communication and quality of life. Um, we had reduced perceptions of handicap and improved speech and noise performance, as well as improvements on many quality of life measures. In addition, I, work that I did years ago showed that we could incorporate a group oral rehabilitation program post hearing aid fitting, and those benefits would be realized much quicker than if an individual was given the hearing aid without the provision of such follow-up care. Communication partners benefit if they participate in the programs because then they truly get to understand why they shouldn't be talking to their husband who's sitting in the living room watching television while they're in the kitchen washing the dishes. Um, and even without device use, I would argue that we really should consider, as Dr. Pecora Fula said, providing information and counseling and teaching people about communication strategies, even when they have mild hearing losses and might not yet be ready to engage in using hearing aids or other forms of personal amplification. In addition, the data suggests that auditory training can be effective for some people, but we do need further research. I'd like to give you some of my final thoughts because I have two more minutes um, regarding hearing loss and healthy aging from a public health perspective, perspective, which means that individuals would recognize they have the condition, that society and individuals would believe it is important and that it should be treated, and that we have effective treatments that could be readily accessible. Well, Age-related hearing loss is not understood to be an important public health issue or we would not be here today. We need to engage, continue to engage in those studies that were described this morning where we look at the cognitive, functional, and social-emotional effects of untreated and treated hearing loss. We also need studies to examine individuals' health beliefs and attitudes about hearing loss and hearing intervention and develop strategies designed to address um, those issues. We also need to do continue, even though we have evidence-based interventions available, we need to continue to improve those interventions, particularly based on our increased understandings of the effects of cognitive aging. And we need to look at examining the potential for how systematic hearing intervention might influence cognitive, functional, and social-emotional status. We do have the lack of insurance coverage for hearing rehabilitative devices and services, and so we need to look and ask 
Is there a reason for the cost of devices to be addressed? And what is the role of PSPs in future health care, which I think we'll hear about at this meeting? I think, as someone said earlier, we also need to be able to continue to demonstrate the value of the interventions that we do provide through cost effectiveness and cost utility analysis. And this needs to be done for both technical and non-technical hearing interventions. I believe that we currently have an overemphasis on the devices rather than an emphasis on developing comprehensive, integrated hearing rehabilitation for older individuals. But I'm thrilled to be here because I think this is a start that can help us change the landscape so that when we deal and look at the spectrum of hearing impairment that's associated with aging, we can provide the appropriate interventions that can mitigate the negative effects, and people can learn to live well with hearing loss as a part of healthy aging. Thank you.